Mr. David Ho, President of the NUSS, Mr. Chandra Mohan, Organizing Chairperson for this evening's event, uh, Pre Professor Tan Jo Chuan, President of the University, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations to NUSS on your 60th anniversary. My theme tonight is Singapore in transition, the next phase. We are now at an inflection point, changing gears, changing pace. We not only need to navigate the eddies and the currents from moment to moment, but we also have to keep in mind some basic principles which will help us to maintain our sense of direction, our momentum, and our purpose. And tonight, I'd just like to share with you three thoughts. First, while we look inwards, we must not forget to look outwards. Second, while we are good-hearted, we must not shy away from being hard-headed. And third, while we immerse ourselves in the present, we have to understand our past and be confident of our future. Let me start with inwards versus outwards. We've got to keep on looking outwards even as we deal with challenges at home. We've been concentrating in recent years on what's happening in Singapore. And understandably so, because we've had urgent issues to deal with housing, public transport, medical care, and so on. And also, as a society, we are making some strategic shifts to prepare for longer-term trends. Trends like changing demographics, aging population, a maturing economy. We are strengthening and enhancing the social risk sharing to bear the vicissitudes of life together. For example, with MediShield Life. We are providing more support to the elderly, for example, through the Pioneer Generation Package and the Silver Support Scheme. We are preparing our workforce for the future through the work of the Aspire Committee and now the Skills Future Committee to create opportunities and upgrading paths for all our people, wherever their positions in our economy. And that's our new way forward. So these are very major changes with very long-term consequences, so we've got to proceed very cautiously and make sure that we get them right. Because once you've made the move, it's irrevocable. So the government has spent a lot of time developing the policies. We've spent time and energy engaging Singaporeans to understand the challenges, shape the policies themselves, and build a consensus on the way forward, for example, through our Singapore conversation. But perhaps because we are so focused on these issues, I fear that Singaporeans aren't paying enough attention to what's happening outside Singapore. More people are getting their news not from reading newspapers or watching the television news or the BBC, but from one another or through the social media and focusing on domestic events. We are absorbed in our daily lives, leaving little time and energy to track less immediate concerns. So I won't give you a test, but I do wonder how many Singaporeans could, off the top of their heads, name the current Prime Minister of Thailand. <laughs> you don't have to put up your hands. Or remember what ISIS stands for. And is that the same as ISIL? So, those are just random facts, but the general point is, I think we are looking inwards, and we're not paying enough attention to the world around us. And there are three reasons why it's important for us to have a broader view. First, it sets our own issues in perspective. We are preoccupied with healthcare financing, with an aging population, with immigration, income inequality, and so many other 
domestic items. But these are not items unique to Singapore. Many other countries in the world, especially developed countries, face similar issues and exactly the same list of things. And we are all facing dealing with the challenges in our different ways. So to make sense of what faces us and to assess what we are doing and to have ideas on what we can do, we have to know that this is not peculiar to Singapore. We have to know how others are tackling their problems and learn from their experiences. And then I think we can see our issues in perspective and we can make a judgment. Is this something which we should be alarmed about, where we should congratulate ourselves, or which we can do something about? So that's the first reason you must look out. The second is that there are major changes in the Asian landscape which are having a big impact on us, more so because we are a small country. Take Indonesia, one of our closest neighbours and partners, and is soon going to have a new president and a government. How will Indonesia change? How will our relations with them develop? India, new prime minister, strong mandate, determined to get the Indian economy moving, keen to make friends with Singapore. How can we take advantage of this? China, continuing to develop rapidly. Many of us still think of China as a low-cost manufacturing base, just a place for labor-intensive factories, sweat from morning till night. But I visited Shenzhen recently, and I went to Tencent, Tengxun, which is one of the Chinese IT companies. And it completely defies this stereotype. It's 15 years old, it's a high-tech firm, many innovative ideas and apps. And the most well-known app probably is WeChat. 350 million users active worldwide, including, I'm sure, some of you here, because there are many users in Singapore. And the, I met them, I talked to them. It's a dynamic young workforce. The ethos, the culture is just like you were in a Silicon Valley company. And it's grown from nothing to become the fourth largest internet company in the world with revenues larger than Facebook. So China is changing. What does its rise mean for Singapore's competitive position? given our limited resources. How do we stay abreast of these changes and not fall behind them? So unless we understand what's happening, first of all, we must know what's happening and understand and grasp how it impacts us. We can't anticipate or respond properly to events. We have always been open, connected and outward-looking in the past. This has been a pillar. These, this has been a pillar of our success. And it's why other leaders seek our views on international matters, because we watch, we study carefully, we have a vested interest in knowing. It's why companies set up their headquarters here, despite Singapore having no natural advantages. It's why our students do well when they travel overseas and study overseas in some of the best top universities in the world. Because they have been in good universities and very good universities in Singapore. And it's also the reason why the Singapore universities are highly regarded in the world, including not least NUS. So you have to know what's happening around us. And thirdly, we have to know what's going to happen in the world, anywhere in the world. Major trends, unexpected developments. Because globalization and technological progress can create and disrupt businesses swiftly, much faster than we think, and much faster than sometimes we would like. Take ports, for example. We are the second biggest port in the world, PSA. We've got multiple terminals in Singapore, six of them, and we're consolidating them all into a single megaport in Tuas. 
eventually, so that you have one centralized, efficient outfit, and we can consolidate our position as a transshipment hub. But the climate is changing. The Arctic Ocean is melting. New sailing roads are opening up. The Northwest Passage, the Northeast Passage, via the Arctic Ocean from Europe to the Far East. Not all the ships will go there, some will, and bypass Singapore and PSA. So what does it mean for us? So we have to watch, we have to understand, and most of you may not have noticed this, but Singapore has become an observer in the Arctic Council. And it's not a joke. We are an equatorial country right in the middle of the tropics. We decided we better become an observer in the Arctic Council it can affect us, and we want to know, and we want to be part of this change. We have no choice. Take another example. Take car-sharing apps like Uber or Grab Taxi. It's changing the nature of the business. What is a business? Not taxis, but bringing people from place to place, providing a service to people where they want it, when they want it, the way they want it. It's given commuters increased options and improved services, but it's disrupted the traditional industries, and in particular the taxi businesses in many cities, and is challenging the regulatory frameworks which govern the taxi operations in cities around the world. And so you find the incumbents very anxious, worried, pushing back resisting, protesting, filing suit, whether it's in London, whether it's in Paris, in Germany, whether it's in Sydney. The change is happening and not everybody likes it. And the technology is coming to Singapore too. It's already here. Not just Uber, but Uber X, Grab Taxi, and there are others as well. And it's futile to resist it or to try to prevent it. And I think it's a wrong attitude because it can bring better services and better lives to our people. So we've got to track this and understand how it can help us. And we've got to have a response to be able to develop a framework to facilitate innovation and at the same time orderly change in the taxi industry and ensure a competitive and a level playing field for both old and new players. So we've got to look out even while we look inwards on ourselves. If we, go to, if we fall to navel-gazing, that's the end of us. Like it or not, the outside world is going to impose change on us, and we have to be prepared for it. We've not solved for all time the problem of earning a living for ourselves more so as we lack a large enough domestic economy in order to sustain ourselves on our own. So we've got to make ourselves valuable to the world. Some of these changes will bring opportunities, others will create new challenges, but we have to do things today with tomorrow in mind. And that requires us to be both good-hearted and hard-headed in our approach. I described our new way forward just now, and people have commended this new way forward for showing more heart rather than head. And indeed, it is important to win hearts, and we are glad that people appreciate what we're trying to do. And I'm glad that the new way forward resonates with Singaporeans. But please don't forget that we cannot be all heart and no head. We must never be hard-hearted, but we must never shy away from being hard-headed. First of all, because we've got to do good-hearted things right. There are many examples from all sorts of countries of the best of intentions producing zero results or worse, sometimes negative results, especially in social policy. And too often, the policies end up hurting the very same people they were intended to help. 
take the problem of poverty. Many countries have generous welfare schemes to alleviate poverty or minimum wage laws to help poorer workers. But none of them have succeeded in eradicating poverty. Instead, they've often created welfare states, bureaucracies, dependencies, disincentive to work, and even higher unemployment. Because what you want from a policy isn't necessarily what you will get from it. You intend some outcomes, but you will often produce unintended results. So that's the first reason we have to be hard-headed, to get the right results. The second reason is because we have to be good-hearted not just to ourselves, but also to our children and to our grandchildren, and that means we've got to be hard-headed about ourselves. Take CPF and healthcare financing. It would be easy for us to lay the burdens on our children, as some other countries have done, by paying for generous welfare benefits through debt financing or hopefully one day future taxation. That's not what we have done. We have the Pioneer Generation package. We could have promised it to pioneers and left it to future generations to find the money to pay for our generosity. But instead, we set aside the money now so that the package is guaranteed, the pioneers can be sure that they will get it, and that our children are not burdened by the cost of what we do. When this government makes a promise, we mean it and we keep it. So while what we do speaks to the heart, we must be hard-headed about how to make it happen and how to live within our means because that's the only way we can deliver on our promises. Thirdly, we need growth and prosperity in order to be good-hearted. And you cannot just get growth and prosperity just by good intentions. Without resources, good intentions mean nothing. We have to grow the economy. It's the only way for our people to have better lives. A rich society isn't always a happy society, but an impoverished society is very seldom happy. We mustn't go pell-mell for growth, regardless of social, human, or environment, environmental costs. Nor are we doing so. But I do worry when people say we should take it easy on growth because we are okay and they talk airily about the more important things in life. They don't understand what our well-being depends on, and I think there's a strong element of condescension and complacency in that view because essentially they're telling others, well, I'm well off enough, you should be satisfied with whatever you have, even if you are poor. Because unless you have growth, you can't make somebody better off without making somebody else well, worse off. And that is not the way forward. One important example where we need both heart and head is our population policy. For example, talking about marriage and parenthood, about immigration, about foreign workers. The heart part is very important here because the population is also about a sense of identity, of nationhood, of belonging. And because you're talking about babies and the next generation and having children, is fundamentally a matter of the heart, or should be. And it cannot just be a response to the size of the baby bonus. And also, we are not just seeking the right size of population, but also a harmonious and open-hearted society and we know that immigration and foreign workers have social impacts, and people have to have time and space to adapt to these impacts and to adjust to one another. So the heart is very important. These are all valid concerns and important considerations when we work out a population policy. But the head part is also important, because hard facts cannot be wished away. What are the hard facts? Our TFR, total fertility rate, is 1.2 babies per woman. 
Our population is aging rapidly. Already one old person for about 10 working persons and getting worse year by year. We have too few nurses to take care of old folks, too few construction workers to build our homes, too few construction workers to build our MRT lines, not enough workers for our companies and SMEs to grow. And I think most Singaporeans understand this. But the issue which vexes Singaporeans, and maybe especially this audience of university alumni, is that we also need foreign PMEs, not just foreign workers or construction workers, but foreign professionals, managers, and executives. Because they compete with Singapore PMEs for jobs. And I can appreciate that from a micro point of view, if I have a foreigner working beside me and in a similar job, he's competing with me, and it means that I'm under greater pressure. But from a macro point of view, allowing foreign professionals to work in Singapore, in fact, creates more good jobs for Singaporeans. Because if we are too tight on the foreign PMEs, I think many companies will be deterred from coming here, and the jobs for Singaporean PMEs may not even exist in the first place. You take the financial industry. During the global financial crisis, we encouraged banks and other financial institutions to expand here, which they did. Even when they were shrinking elsewhere, our financial sector grew. And now we have a good critical mass of financial institutions, and it's strengthened our financial center and created many more jobs for our professionals. But it's also meant a lot more foreign professionals here in finance and banking and insurance, because the banks do business internationally, and they need a multinational workforce, and they need that mix, they need those numbers. Unfortunately, this has created a perception among Singaporeans working in finance that, well, sometimes we don't get fair treatment. And I'm sure that once in a while, that's in fact true. And that is why we've created TAFEP, the Tripartite Group for Fair Employment Practices, as a mechanism to investigate cases, complaints, and do something about them. And I think the foreign employers are cooperating with us. Because we are determined to get a fair deal for Singaporean employees. But at the same time, I think I should remind Singaporeans that we have to compete on our merits and contributions. It applies to all our workers, whether you're blue collar, whether you're white collar, whether you're professional, whether you're the boss or the employee, whether you're in the government or in the private sector. You have to compete on your merits and contributions because that's ultimately the only way we can secure our jobs and careers. On the overall population policy, we are paying attention both to the emotional and practical aspects of the problem. In terms of heart, we are giving weight to how comfortable people are with the pace of immigration. We are encouraging the new arrivals to adapt to Singapore norms, to the way our society functions. In terms of head, we are watching the numbers, keeping the inflows moderate and sustainable. So last year, when we debated the Population White Paper in Parliament, the government proposed moderating the foreign worker inflows. The opposition rejected this. They argued for zero foreign worker growth. They said no inflows, shut it off. It was a populist and irresponsible pose. It was not a serious policy. Because such a freeze would have harmed our economy, and in particular would have hurt many of the SMEs which desperately need workers and would have caused Singaporeans to suffer and lose jobs. So we didn't do that, but instead we decided to moderate the foreign worker inflow, not to stop it. Even this is painful. We know that. The policies are biting. Many SMEs are finding it tough, despite all our schemes to help them. So nowadays you don't hear any more demands from the opposition for zero foreign worker growth. But what we are doing 
what we said we would do and what we are doing is necessary and is working. And the latest manpower numbers, numbers do show that the foreign worker growth has slowed down, is now a more sustainable level, and is about where we want it to be. And I don't expect any further measures to tighten foreign worker numbers further. Meanwhile, our economic restructuring is progressing, productivity is improving, at least in some sectors, and we are steadily catching up in terms of our infrastructure, our housing, public transport, and so on. So you must put together your heart and your head and think carefully, feel how people feel, and choose a solution which addresses, to the extent possible, both heart and head, and convince people to accept it and to support it. But I'm under no illusions that this problem is over, because population is always a sensitive topic here and in all countries. Many others face similar issues with immigration and with the response of the population to the immigrants. And often you see nasty anti-immigrant sentiments. In the UK, you have the UKIP. In, the, in France, you have the National Front Party, which is now led by Le Pen, the daughter of another right-wing nationalist politician. Even in Hong Kong, where you're talking about one country, two systems, the people are very, very sensitive about Chinese immigrants from the PRC and Chinese workers from the PRC. Or Sweden, which is a famously liberal and big-hearted country. They've taken a lot of foreign immigrants and refugees, and now they are seeing a right-wing nasty party and an anti-immigrant backlash. So we have to avoid going down this road. We have to manage our numbers. We have to stay open and welcome those who are ready to contribute to Singapore and who are ready, able to contribute and ready to make their home here. We must maintain our reputation for being a good place to live and work because we lose that at our peril. If people think that we are not interested in attracting investments, that talent is not welcome, that we've turned inwards, I think that's the end of us. And these are real dangers because I see a we see the tendencies, I'm sure you do too, especially on the internet, to blame everything bad that happens in Singapore on foreigners and blame all foreigners on anything bad that any one non-Singaporean does. All bad things are done by foreigners and all foreigners do bad things. And even, and they even get blamed for some things which have nothing to do with them, like winning medals at the Asian Games. <laughs> Joseph Schooling, he's born here, his father is born here, he happens to be Eurasian. He won a gold medal. In fact, he won three medals and he was called an Ang Moor foreign talent. <laughs> I think it's a compliment to the Ang Moor foreign talent. So I'm ashamed and dismayed when I read such virulent and nasty attitudes, and I'm sure so are many other Singaporeans. And we have to stand up and have the courage to say so, and not be cowed into being silent. There are problems of integration, problems of numbers, congestion, we deal with them. But bad behavior, rude behavior, behavior which just is really a disgrace to a Singaporean or to a human being, we should have the courage to call it such. We have to be both good-hearted and hard-headed, understand the anxieties of people and do our best to address them, but be honest and clear about what we need to do for the good of Singapore and to secure our future. To have an eye on what lies ahead has always been the Singapore way. Even as we focus on the present, we must look forward and have confidence in the future. And perhaps less obviously, we also have to know and understand the past, and especially our past. Because unless we understand our past, we will fail to appreciate what Singapore's success depends upon, why Singapore works the way it does, and we will become unjustifiably pessimistic about our future prospects. Foreign visitors often ask me, 
What's your secret of success? Can we transplant that secret and that success elsewhere? And I reply to them, it's very hard to do. Not that I'm not willing to share or to explain. I can do that. But what we have achieved here is not just because of who we happen to be. It's also a function of our history and our Southeast Asian context. It depends on how we became independent, how the pioneer generation responded to the critical challenge of building a nation from nothing and created the, res the challenge and the response and a virtuous cycle of conditions and results to bring us to today. And you cannot create that cycle starting from any other random starting point or out of nothing just by saying, I want to do that. We are stable and peaceful now, but our society experienced upheavals and riots, communal riots, and there was a ferocious fight with the communists. We are friends with our neighbours now, but we had very difficult relations before, irreconcilable differences with Malaysia, when we were in Malaysia, confrontasi with Indonesia, which was a war, a low-intensity war, although it was not called war. So how did we get here from there in the span of half a century? Well, we ourselves must know this history to understand how Singapore works and why we do the things we do. For example, why, do we, why did we invent new water? Because water was critical to our survival, and we know we cannot rely wholly on imported water. And even today, if you read the newspapers, even within the last few weeks, people are saying, how about we charge them a little bit more for the water? Why do we have the SAF and National Service? because we know we cannot depend on anyone else to defend us. We have to be prepared to stand up and fight ourselves. Why did we build Jurong Island? Because we decided that despite our limited land, even though we have no oil and no gas, we could still build a competitive petrochemical industry and we can provide jobs, good jobs, for our people. Imagine it. Decide on it, do it, and make it happen. It goes back to independence and before. And it's 1950s, 1960s, within living memory, but the events are receding into the past. And many of us to here today are too young to have personally experienced these formative moments. So our schools work hard to teach students the essential facts of our nationhood. But many Singaporeans only have the vaguest ideas of what Confrontasi was about, uh, who are the communists, and why are they different from the communalists. If I ask you, I suspect, to name one communist figure in Singapore, or one communalist figure, something to do with the history of Singapore, I suspect Many of you would find it hard put to do so, unless you go and look up Google. <laughs> so the lessons of history need to be reinforced, because if we don't remember them, we may not learn the hard-won lessons, and we may fail to value what we have painstakingly built. SG50, our 50th anniversary next year, is an important occasion to remember this history. Confrontasi was a violent conflict, so we are going to erect a memorial to the victims opposite McDonald House. The fight against the communists, if it had gone the other way, Singapore would have been very, very different. So we are planning a marker to remember and honour those who fought against the communists for a democratic, non-communist future for Singapore. And we're also republishing next week the battle for merger, which was 
The collection of radio talks by Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, which he gave in 1961, which exposed the real aims of the communists, explained what was at stake and why it was important for Singaporeans to support merger with Malaysia. These are events from 50 years ago. There will be more recent significant events in our history, maybe too recent for us to commemorate in the same way. But as time passes and events recede into the past, we will look back and recognize the crisis experience, the challenges overcome, the achievements hard won that were important milestones in our nation building. And in time, we will decide that well, they too require visible reminders, lest we forget. But SG50 should also be a time to look ahead, to set new goals for the next half century, to see and be excited by the opportunities opening up, to appreciate our strengths and capabilities and not just the uncertainties and the difficulties, to give back to society, so that we strengthen a fair and just society in Singapore. We have to have the confidence to aim high, to dream and to build on what we have, to make Singapore better than any other country to live in and to be an exceptional society. Sometimes young people express anxiety about the future. They wonder whether their lives will be better than their parents. And it's not so surprising because it's a time of rapid change, of flux, of intense competition, and therefore of some self-doubt. Even in China, where life has been improving faster than nearly anywhere else in the world, any time in human history, young people feel pressured and anxious, and even successful young people who have university degrees and good jobs in thriving cities like Chongqing and Shanghai also feel this existential angst and worry that the best years are past and they won't have it as good as their parents. But if we understand the opportunities which are opening up for us and realize what we can do to get ourselves ready for them, then far from being anxious, we should be eager and ready to go. We are already transforming Singapore in many ambitious ways. We are remaking our home expanding Changi Airport, moving Paya Lebar Air Base, shifting PSA to Tuas, building Jurong Lake District, doubling our MRT network. That's just the hardware, but we are also investing in our people, new universities, the work of Aspire and Jobs Future, more opportunities for every citizen, and we are implementing bold social policies to keep this a fair and just society. We have the resources, we have the talent, the base to go further, to make this a truly exceptional cosmopolitan city with an open and vibrant economy where we work hard but enjoy a high quality of life, where we live in an endearing home with our families and friends, and we can live our lives and compare where we are with where our parents are and say, yes, we've made this a better place. Many of our young people now have opportunities to work anywhere and to thrive anywhere. And there are so many more openings available to us to experience the world, to live our dreams, to achieve our aspirations well beyond material well-being. Many of our grandparents and parents didn't even go to school and couldn't have imagined that the world their children live in today or the way their children live in the world today. Just 1980, quarter century ago, only 5% of each age group P1 cohort went to university. Today, 30% of each P1 cohort enters publicly funded universities in Singapore to pursue full-time undergraduate degrees. And even those who don't, they will have graduated from the poly or from the ITE, and they'll have many chances to move up in life. So 
anxiety is understandable, anxiety is even constructive up to a point. Even some paranoia is helpful because, as Andy Grove says, only the paranoid survive. And it can keep you on your toes. It's like the anxiety you feel before you go on stage to perform. But it shouldn't lead to paralysis or despondency, and we need to be both paranoid, but at the same time, paradoxically, confident. Then we can make this a special nation for Singaporeans. This evening, I've deliberately not spoken about what the government is doing, because naturally the government will do its part, will do more, will do whatever we need to. But for Singapore to succeed, everybody must do your part, our part. And the responsibility is also on individuals, on civil society, on the community, not only to understand what's happening to the country, to our society, the issues that we face, but also to play your part, to actively contribute to the community, to work hard, to follow what's happening around us, and solve problems and open new windows for us. And I'm glad that the NUSS and the alumni are doing this, you are creating opportunities for the next generation through bursaries and awards. You are increasing awareness by organizing forums and lectures like this one. You are giving back to society through community events for senior citizens and the underprivileged. So I urge all of us, look outwards. Don't obsess inwards. Act with both our heads and our hearts. And take heart from the past and be confident of the future. And that's the way to move forward together and create a brighter future for all of us. Thank you very much.